Well, tonight I, I want to share with you my testimony of what the Lord has done in my life. <coughs> and I'll have to do when I get married. We put a little picture up on the wall and it said this, the Lord hath done great things for us, or offward that. So I'm glad to be along tonight to speak of Christ and his working in my life. And I base my testimony on the lost sheep. You find here that this man, after a day's work, he's looking at his flock and he has a problem because he notices that one of the sheep is lost. He's counting them 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. And he realizes that one of his sheep is lost. Now it is a fault, not of the shepherd. It's a fault of the sheep. Disobedience. It has wandered off. It is far from the shepherd. It is in great danger. It's lost. You find here in this passage of Luke 15, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And he wanted to impress a, a simple, simple truth on those who heard him here, the Pharisees and the scribes and the sinners in verse 1. They were lost. I want to tell you, it's a terrible thing to be lost. There may be some in this meeting tonight, and you're brought up with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you're still lost. And there was a time in my life that I was lost, and I didn't know it. I was brought up in a family in Glenar. My name is Noel Shields. There are ten children in the family. It was not a Christian home. I hear people giving their testimony. Well, I, I had the privilege of being brought up in a Christian home. We had the Bible and all the rest of it. Our home was not a Christian home. Now, we were sent to the Church of Ireland. We had to go to Sunday school and things like that. But I never remember hearing the gospel at all in the Church of Ireland. My dad used to drink. And I remember saying to Mom, I said, Mom, you know, when I grow up, I'm never going to drink. Never going to go to the pubs. Never going to go to the clubs. I, I want really nothing to do with drink. And I want to say this, I meant it. I meant that. But you know, as I was a young lad then, there I was in this home. We were sent to Sunday school, but hardly went to church at all. Mom says, well, you're going to have to get confirmed. And when you get confirmed, you can do whatever you like. Well, I couldn't wait the day came. I walked up the church. I bowed down before the bishop. He put his hands on my head. I think that's what happened to my hair. I don't know. <laughs> it's a blame game nowadays. You can blame for anything if they only can prove it. I used to mop with a poorly hair. Hard to believe, of course. But that's the way it was years ago. And I walked down the church. Next week, I had to go back for a communion. I had to say it meant nothing to me. I remember I pulled up the church, bowing down at the front, <coughs> laughing, sniggering. Making a mock of the whole thing. And down the aisle I walked that day, on Sunday. It was goodbye to church. Goodbye to Sunday school. And it was goodbye to God. I was finished. I was me finished. I felt confirmed. A confirmed sinner. That's what I was. And I can say then I was me and a young lad. And I love life. I, I love football. And maybe some footballers here. Well, I can say that I was a Manchester United. Fanatic. I was a nutcase. And I dreamt that one day I'd be a footballer. I'd love to be a footballer, but I say I was not good enough. That's probably was the reason I wasn't spot. But I love football. I played in pipe bands and uh, playing football for different teams. I left school. Boy, that was a great day. Oh, happy, happy day. But well, was maybe teachers here, I'm in trouble. But well, that make no difference. I was always in trouble. I was teachers. I never liked school. But what a day it was when I left school. But you know, I was 16, you would have thought I was a big fella. And where do you think I went to at 16? I went to the pub at 16. Oh, well, that was very subtle. It'll get you in, you know. Come on, all in. Give a game of pool. And just one pint of shandy, if some people know about alcohol here tonight, is just beer and lemonade and mix it up, sweeten it up a bit for them. And there was me with this wee skinny fella at 16 holding on to this big pint. 
and there I was starting. And before I knew it where it was, there was two pints and three pints. Take the lemonade out of it, and then it was what you. And you know, I remember being so drunk at the age of 17 one night in Market Hill. I was lying in the snow in the street. I hear the fellow says, Mum, when I grow up, I'll never drink. But some take your father, and you want to go. And this was my life. A young lad playing football, working, playing in a pipe band. And I came home one night, and my mum met me, and she told me my dad had taken ill. And he was out in, in a pub in Newtown Hamilton. And three days later, I just ran about. She could run up the stairs to tell us that he had died. And you say, well, no, that must have shaken me. Well, it did shake me. But I had to say this, I never thought about God. I never thought about my soul. I never thought about sin at all. And I then was getting older then, and I started to think, not just one night a week, but four or five nights a week, I would have been found drinking with my friends. That was just our life. What else was there in life? We, we run about, we worked, and any money in our pockets, you go into the bar, and the way we went to town, that was it. And so it was, on Saturdays, I see him the same, on Sundays, and so on. And even though I was doing all these things, I had my football team, I had my job, I was playing a tight band, drumming, and, and drinking, and all these things. I used to pretend that, well, I was happy. And maybe when you thought about drop a drink in you with a life and soul of a party. Well, it's very easy to pretend you're happy. And there I was in the world drinking and all the rest of it. But there was something in my heart. I said, there's something not right here. There's something missing in my life. And I don't know what it is. And you know, I looked at my life. And I saw I had an old banger of a car and I had a girlfriend and I playing in a band and playing football and... I said, but there's something missing. There's something not right. But I want to tell you this. I didn't know I was lost. And that's what the problem was. I didn't know I was like this lost sheep. I had gone astray. I didn't know. I wasn't brought up in the gospel. I went to children's meetings. I'm ashamed to say I got put out of them when I was a young lad growing up. I did not know. I was lost. And you're not here to make sure. No, I know I'm lost. I'm brought up with the gospel. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm on my way to hell. Well, thank God. He has shown you these things. I didn't know it. The young lad going about in the world, in the pubs, the clubs, the discos, and that life. I said, there's something wrong here. <coughs> I, I was lost. I was lost. And you find here in this parable that the shepherd, when he lost the sheep and had 99, his heart went out to the one that was lost. And he went out looking for it, searching for it. He went personally himself. He didn't send somebody else to look for it. He went patiently looking over the hills, the valleys, behind the walls. He was searching, calling out for the sheep that was lost. But you know, the Bible tells me, and I want you to think of this verse tonight, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I want glad tonight that the Lord Jesus came looking for me. A mission came to my village in Glen Ann, that's the other side of Marky Hill, in 1983. Now, I was one of the last people who expected in that mission. You never guess who was doing the mission. The Free Presbyterians. Well, boys, I hated the Free Presbyterians. <laughs> and they were coming to my village. I knew nothing about it. But I just went Paisley, just that's where I was in those days. They're coming to my village to do a mission. And I was half a man. My sister used to go to when I used to visit her. And we ended up arguing about the Bible, about Dr. Paisley. And I was ripping mad. And boys were coming to my village to do a mission. <sighs> my sister said to me, yeah, let me go to a mission. I says, I have no more notion going to that mission. I'm going to the But I didn't know there was somebody looking for me in that mission. It was God. And I was drinking away at this time. And I'm probably answering, I haven't time tonight to go in how God brought me in. But God brought me in. Bro, 
broke all my plans I had in drinking and all running about. And the Lord spoke to my heart and says, you're running about and your life is going nowhere. He says, get you to that mission. This all came over me to go to the mission. I, I didn't do missions. I didn't do that. was not me. No, I phoned my mate and I said, do you fancy going to this meeting here at the corner? And he says, yes, I'll go with you. Well, the two of us drank together. So then we went into this meeting and boys, I sat down. And you know, I looked around me that night. And I saw God's people were happy. And they were singing. They were full of praise. I was miserable in my in my sin and in the world. And this man called Joe Payton, I'm sure most of you have heard his testimony. Joe Payton got up to give, I never knew him in my life, never met him in my life. He got up to give his testimony. And I thought Joe Payton was talking about me. Because he told how he was a young lad, he had a school, that was me. Told how he loved football. Told how he drank and racked about. Told how he watched his father die. I was taking all the boxes. And then he told how the Lord had saved them. And that night I heard the young man. I said, there's what's missing. I needed my saved. I didn't know it. I'm lost. And in my sin, I'm heading down towards hell. I'm far away from God. I'm, I'm lost. And you know something? I was back in the mission the next night. And it's back in the mission the next night, and every night of the meeting, I forget how long it was after that, I, I was going to this mission, and I used to sing, just as I am, without one plea, come to Christ. And I said, well, I want to come. But the devil says you're too young. It's only your early 20s. And the devil says you'll never keep it. When I left that mission, I'll never be saved. But I want to tell you here tonight, I heard the answer. I needed Jesus Christ. He loved me. And he bled and died upon the cross. And he could save me. In 1983, I fell in with Joan, who's now my wife. And probably you didn't know that when you fell in with me in 1983. That's the way I was going to end up. But that's the way I was ended up. And I was going with Joan at this time in 83. But I was under real conviction of sin. And when I was in bars, I, people didn't know. I took way outside and stand and say, Lord, I'm not ready. If you come, I'm not ready. I used to go to watch Northern Ireland when very few went to watch them years ago when they were useless. <laughs> Glad to see them doing better now. I used to go, I used to watch the fighting in the cop. That was more interesting the way he used to be fighting. But you know something? Even when I stood in football matches, I felt I needed a saved. No matter where I was going and what was happening, the Lord was searching for me. He was calling me and showing me I should come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I used to be able to pray for a firm and I did a job for this man. It must be the 11th of July night. I said, put it down. I didn't, never met this man in my life. I did a job for him. I put a machine in for him. And he, I was packing up the crane and he just reached up his hand. There was a pound in it. So it's 1984, I think this was maybe. But he held this up a pound. And he says to me, uh, he says, that's not a tip for you. He said, thanks very much. That'll get me a pint tonight. He took two steps forward. He took a step back. He looked up at me and he says, did I hear you say that'll get you a pint? I says, you did. It was a lot of faith, you know. And his boy was saved. And boys, he started to preach to me up through the window of the crane. And I looked down on him and I says, what do you think of Paisley? I got the whole thing changed from myself. He says, so you were coming back here. He says, I hope you're saved. But sure enough, I was back in September and I put another machine in for him and he reached up and gave me a pound and this time I didn't say anything at all. But I didn't have to. And I was standing beside the crane with that man and he was preaching to me about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how he loved me and how I needed to see him. And you know, I loved everything he was saying. And a car drove up the drive and who got out of the car? Only his minister. And there I was stuck between these two men. <laughs> And they were, but I loved it. And he says to me, no, there, there's something holding you back. Well, you know there was. I was a curse like a trooper, of course, I looked to my shame. And in the bars and drinking. But Joan and I was going to get engaged at Christmas. And the devil says, you get engaged. It's all over. Or you get, sorry, you get saved. 
Sorry. Can you have another one? That's it. The voyage is over. Isn't it? So, where was it there? He said, if you can see it, it's all over. And uh, so, anyway, David looked at me. He says, Noel, I'm going to ask you the most important question in your life. And this question is found in the Bible. I'm going to ask it to you too. Pilate asked the question. He says, what shall I then do with Jesus, which is called Christ? And he looked at me and says, Lord, what are you going to do with Jesus, which is called Christ? For God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I was just thumped in my heart. He didn't know it. I was pierced. And I climbed up onto that train and driving up the road. And he told me before he left, he says, no, I'll pray for you. But that text went through my mind all night. What shall I then do with Jesus? Which is called Christ. The Lord was looking for me, no matter where I went. And he's looking for you tonight here in this meeting. I would love to see Joan that night. And I remember he mentioned this off the cuff. I was thinking about getting saved, but it was just mentioned off the cuff and put down again. Said, that's okay. But we never discussed it really openly at all and fully. And, uh, but I was under severe pressure. Of course, Christmas came, and Joe and I got engaged. Call up the Christmas. And I was under severe pressure on, on a conviction of sin because the Lord Jesus was looking for me. He had come to seek and to see of that which was lost. He was calling for me to come to him, and the devil fought against me. You'll never keep it, he says. And your friends will laugh at you in the bars. And then he says the trump card was, Joan, you loser. She doesn't want you to be saved. And all of this battle was going in within my soul. Because the Lord was looking for me. Well, I can say, we find in the passage that shepherd searched and he lifted the sheep. Lifted and put on his shoulders. And you know, friends, he carried it home much lesson. Well, it was the 19th of January, 1985, I could see him. But the night before I could see it, I was in the usual place. I was still in the pubs. I was drinking in a bar in Marky Hill. And this man, who I knew from as a wee lad, came walking down the bar, and he stopped right behind me. And I, I was up drinking at the bar, and he stopped and he looked at me. You know what he said? He says, Noel. And I turned around. He says, nobody loves me. And I knew the man. He lost his wife lost his family and everything because of drink. But friends, I have found the answer. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I want to get off the bar and say, listen, you're wrong because I, I thought nobody loved me. I wanted to say, listen, I want to tell you, Christ loves us and he died for us and he can save us. You need to be saved. And I wanted to tell him, of course, I wasn't going to do this in the middle of the bar. So I never told him, but I have told him. That's now part of the story, perhaps later, but I have told him after my conversion. Well, I got shown home that night. There was another friend of mine hanging over the wall drunk. Got him home. The Lord says, no, give your life to me. You can help your friend. I saw things differently now from that mission. I said, we're all dancing and laughing away into hell. I need Christ. So, so I went to bed and I tossed back and forward all night. And of course, 19th of January, 1985, I awoke. And I put it all through my mind. I says, the devil says, you're not keeping it. Your friends will laugh at you. You'll lose, Joe. I fired a blanket spark. And I said, Lord, I'm coming home. Take care of the rest of my sin. And I run over to the window. We usually, when you get up in the morning, you usually pull the, the curtain. I see once in a while, I'm like, what a fall of snow has been. 19th of January 1985. I went downstairs to dress. My mum says you went to the bar. Or you should go early on Sunday morning for the cure. And I says, no. Never said where it's going. And I drove through the snow up there. I had to go down my roadway because the road was such a fall of snow. And I was so afraid of something happening and taking away my life. I was so close. And I was driving up a drive even if the minister was the Robert Alec Chambers was the minister of Mother Class. The car actually was stuck in the drive. And I walked up through the snow. 
and a vine grower. And his wife came out and he came out. And I said, could you show me how to be saved? Could you show me how to be saved? And friends, he brought me in. And he opened up the Bible. And he showed me. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. And he's told me he could smell the Bible. He didn't have it that morning, but after, he could smell alcohol from the night before. And I bowed in his room. And I says, Lord, save me. Save me. And friends, he saved me. He saved me. And that's part one of my testimony. I got up and I knew I was saved. I opened the door and he says, or he said to me, Are you saved? No, and I says, I'm saved. I knew it. I tell you, I didn't know the Bible at all, but I knew that the Lord had heard my prayer. And I was saved. Now, of course, I had to face everybody at home. And I had to go home and I told them, I told my mom and then thought, something has happened to Noel, calling my sister, come, something has happened, tell me I've got saved. I met my best friend out in the street and he says, I said, I've got saved. He just looked at me through the window and he says, I give you one week. <laughs> and away he went. And then I had to face Joe. And you know, I thought I was going to lose Joe. And I really did. And uh, after, even for weeks after, a few weeks after, I thought I was going to lose Joe. No matter why one time a man, God used him. And he says, I told him, I think I'm going to lose Joan here. I can see if he looked at me, this man was not saved. He said to me, no one, are you going to turn back? Are you going to turn back for Joan? And I says, there's no turning back. There's no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. And the weight's walked off me. And I can say, I don't see Joan that night, and things have changed between us. And uh, we started to talk, you know, that sort of, it all picked her no sound sometimes. The sound now was working. It was a good job. <laughs> that was great. Sometimes the sound goes off now, perhaps as well. But now the sound goes back on again. And we got chatting. And, you know, about 10 weeks after my conversion, Joan was saved. Joan was saved as well. And some of the family got saved. The boys were drinking the bars with got saved. And so on. So that's really how I came to Jesus Christ. And that's really part one. Well, how did God call me? Because I can tell you here tonight, I never liked school. I'm not promoting that. Well, I never liked that. I learned very little school. But the Lord had learned me a great lesson. That Jesus saves and his blood washes whiter than the snow. And from the very time I got converted, I wanted to share the people the answer. I, I searched. I wondered what the answer was in my life. And I found the answer. Was Jesus Christ. I had a burden. And from the moment I went home, I, I, I said to my family, I could see it. I told my best friend, I could see it. I told Joan, I could see it. I never had it from anybody. I went to work on Monday morning. I went for a firm and I drove the crane. It was early in the morning. And the boss said to me, uh, he said, early in the morning, he says to me, Would you like a wee drop of whiskey? He said, to warm you up. And I said, Look at I said, I would need no more whiskey. As I was saved at the weekend. And I knew he would have told all my friends that came I came back into the yard, but it didn't matter. For I told them anyway. And the Lord had this burden upon my heart that I might be saved. It was a start, I can tell you, of a new life. Of a new life. And from the very commands of my conversion, just shortly after, I felt the Lord working in my heart that He's going to call me to be a preacher of the gospel. I just felt this. And I remember being down in Portland Owen in the church. It was empty. It was through the week. And I felt constrained to go up in behind the pulpit. I looked behind the pulpit. And I just felt, so it came to my heart, this is your life from now on. There's an empty church. I was standing in the church myself. The other men were out in some room, all the parts of the building. And I never said to anyone. I just felt the Lord was dealing with my heart. But that was not how God called me. There was a wee CWU meeting hall in Glenan. I used to go to that. I got a great surprise when I got saved, and it was this. The gospel was being preached in my village, and I didn't know it. I got fired a stone and hit the hall. Many of the time I did, when it was a young fella. But, but that's a different story. And uh, I said, the gospel is being preached in my village. And I didn't know it. So after a service, I used to go and, and, and help out. And I'd go into a meeting, sit with maybe 12 or 20 people. 
And one night, the, the man didn't turn up the preacher, and the man said, oh, would you come and give your testimony? And I said, well, and I just got up out of the blue and just battered away. I gave him a testimony. And after the beating, the man says to me, would you come back and preach? I said, oh, well, I've never preached in my life. I knew nothing about it. And so the date was set. And the night I was, he went to preach. There was over a hundred people turned up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just all the old wee folk, he said, no people. <laughs> Some of my mates came and brought their mums with them and their dads <laughs> along. And the old mates and all that came, the boys I was rough as ropes, I'm not enough now. But I said, you need to be saved, you know. You're going to hell, you know. And only Jesus can save you, you know. That's all you heard. You know, so. But the people, but you know something? From the pub to the pub. And the people went out and said, boys, boys, they saw the change that the Lord had done in my heart. Well, it was in that particular meeting that I was in one night. And this man, and I'm watching the clock, this man was saying, but find out what God wants you to do in your life. I couldn't really get home. And I got home and I prayed, and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to be a preacher of the gospel? And there was no answer. And I came home on Monday night, and I, and I again I prayed to the Lord, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, on the Monday night it was, I was preaching and looking at the Bible and I was reading the Bible and said, Help those women which labor with me in the gospel. And in verse 9 of Philippians 4, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now I, I can only say, I know God was speaking to me. The things that I have learned and heard and received, do them. And I knew, and I'll be verse to help them in the gospel. That God had called me. And I went downstairs and said to Mom, the Lord has called me. And, and I thought it would be a minister at that time. I didn't know what, I didn't know what it was. Well, the next night was a prayer meeting. And I knew God had called me. And I said to Reverend Chambers, I said to say, the Lord has called me. And I wasn't expecting his answer. Nobody said to me, what has he called you to do? Well, I said, I didn't know. I don't know. I thought it was only Martha that left up the school bag and away he went to college. <laughs> I didn't know. But I says, I'll soon find out. That's what I thought. You see, God called me. We need people who's called to preach the gospel. Well, the Lord's going to learn me a lesson. All to Jesus, I surrender. And I went home and I prayed. And this was 1985, uh, 1986. And I prayed to the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? Just wait on the answer. But there was no answer. And I prayed, oh, Lord, what do you want me to do? There was still no answer. And Joe and I got married and all the rest, and there was still no answer. I said, boys, there's something not right here. There must be something wrong. I looked at my life and said, there must be something in my life the Lord doesn't want. And I had a look, you know what was in it? There was something that God didn't want. It was football. I said, it was football crazy. A football man. And I could see it. I never even tried to give up football. I still played with my mates. I didn't go to the bars with them. On a Saturday afternoon, the sleeves were rolled up, the boots were on, and I was out playing for my local team. I loved the football. I just surely the Lord doesn't want me to give up the football. Like I go to the children's meetings, I go to the prayer meetings, I go to the youth meetings, I go to any meetings. Surely Saturday afternoon he doesn't want me. You know, I fought against him. And I realized the Lord wanted me to surrender all. Now there's a lot of people, football, put, put your boot in it, and that's the end of it. Football was my life. And as I cut it off my right arm, I rung the manager up and I says to him, uh, I'm giving up the football. He says, Don't, it'll never be the same without you here. I said, listen, I'm giving up the football. And I must say, I went upstairs and I put a nail into the wall and I hung the boots up and I had a wee cry. I had to confess. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm all yours now. And I want to tell you, that was a missing link. That was a mistake. God wanted me to surrender all on the altar for him. And you how much I love football. I played a part of my life all my life. I wanted all of me on the altar. And so there it was. The doors opened up for me to preach. The doors opened up for me to go to Whiffy College. And when I went to the Whiffy College of the Bible, I got a good surprise. I had a football team on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so... I played about a dinner time and showed a few skills like Jordy Best, some people can remember. And they said, Would you play for us, boy? 
And I says, oh, well, what was I were playing Porty Down one of these Saturdays? Oh, well, I says, well, sure. I thought it was up with that one, but too bad. What are all Christians? Huh? Why? I'll tell you. So I got out of that bed that Saturday morning, the boots off the peg, down that road in the car, got all dressed up the pitch. I said, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm back <coughs> in football. And they're rolling up the pitch, playing away. And I said, we're back, boys. And I went to get here. And I walked over to the side of the pitch. And I said, Lord, touch my back and let my back on you. But God didn't touch my back. And I went home, we got me gathered up and into the car. And I went into the home and I opened my Bible for reading that night. You would have read. If thy vow vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to repay it, for the Lord thy God shall surely require thee. I broke my vow. I says, Lord, I give all to you. And I reached up and took it back. The boots went back onto the peg. And then a few years after, I was doing the meetings and I did a skill and the boys asked me to play it one night. I thought, oh, I maybe will play. <laughs> Ended up in a skill and horseman. <laughs> <laughs> so the football career is over. <laughs> it's over. It's all there, particularly the grandchildren. That's about it. They get away with that. But the football career is over. What I'm saying is this. All to Jesus I surrender. Do we not sing that? Do you not sing it? But do you mean it? The Lord asks you to give up everything. Not what you love in your life. <coughs> that was my love for football. I said the things of family. All to Jesus I surrender. If we're going to live for Christ, then God will go upon the altar. So I ended up going to college and I learned another thing about my call is willingness to go. We had to be willing to go to the Lord wants you. And uh, so I've got to tell the Lord, the Lord called me to be an evangelist, do, full, uh, do the work of the evangelist, do make full proof of thy ministry. He showed me then clearly what it was to do, to be an evangelist. So I went into college, and I came out of college, and I thought I would go to the south of Ireland, but the Lord sent me to Northern Ireland. And I started to be an evangelist in Northern Ireland, full-time preaching, the gospel, doing gospel campaigns in 1990. And I applied to the mission board and then, and they accepted me as a home evangelist. And there I was doing missions, but the phone rang in 1991, and I was asked to go to Australia for two years. So I prayed about it, and the Lord told me to go. But I always said I should have put on the prayer card, home and away, for the next one. <laughs> I was home, and I was away to Australia. And, uh, but that is the willingness to go. And you know, it's not easy to go. You have to leave your family, and your friends, and you put all... So Joe and I had to take with three children at that time, and we went to Australia, and I served the Lord in the work of Lock, and did preaching every Sunday, doing evangelism around, I do door-to-door evangelism, I bring the gospel to people, but people don't come in, so we go out with the gospel. And then I, when I was, I served the Lord in missions, and then over in Australia, and while I was getting ready over Australia, Father says to me, I hear a rumor they're going to send you to England. And uh, if there are any English people here tonight, I apologize to you for what I'm going to say here. But, but he says, I'm going to send you to England. And I says, no way that they send me to England. Because I says, I know where am I going to England. He says, they're going to send you to England. I says, I'm not going to England. Don't care who says it, I will not be going to England. There's one place I never wanted to go to preach. That was England. I used to pray, Lord, send labors into England to preach the gospel. And all you heard the back of my voice, the back of my mind was, I don't know me. <laughs> I don't know who said it. That's what you would have heard. Well, anyway, I was so full of bitterness and hardness of heart. And I said, Lord, I'm going to preach here this morning. How can I go to preach this week for the heart of this? I got him aside in my bed and I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere for you. I'll even go down. <laughs> and I haven't been asked to fix you to go down. But there was a great peace came over my heart. I go down. But you see, through the middle of the week, I got a phone call. And the wife says, No, you're possibly going down. He saved me a phone the week before, and I told him to go himself. <laughs> I said, That's all what I told him. Just to jump the plane to yourself. I'm not going down. I said, I prayed about it. Well, I, I found I was going that time, but you know, I came home and I ended all the land and I started doing missions. The door never opened that time. And I was preaching in missions in Northern Ireland, doing gospel campaigns, children's missions, and gospel missions. Throughout our province, doing missions, and Joe and I had just bought a wee council house in our, in our village in Glen Allen. We put an extension on the back of it, we're putting a paint on it. And 
I found right. But you go down. You go down and die. And I prayed about it. And the Lord told me to go down. And so people thought we were mad. They just bought the house. But this had done the house up. And now the house and all had to go. You see, we sing another hymn. Where he leads me, I will go. You had to follow him. So one thing, and I served the Lord for seven years, working in the church of Lewis, did evangelistic work and preaching in the church every Sunday and all as usual, the church services. And I was asked to go to Kikil. I thought, no, I'd never go to Kikil. But you know when you pray? The Lord says, go to Kikil. And I served the Lord, assistant minister, with the Reverend Mercer and Reverend Patterson. For nearly 10 years, I was served a Christ in the more early, I did the uh, evangelistic work. I visited all the homes around the Keel and Warren Point, and Strabber, my Roman Catholic home, praying the gospel. And then the Lord uh, I asked to go to St. Rar, and I said I would go for two years. I was just to see how it was for everybody. So I went over to St. Rar. And that was a very difficult call because this was different. This time we're going without our children. And mothers and all know what that is like. But two at home, and they were big, but I tell you what, they're still their children. And to go home, they said, and listen, I have to go to Scotland. That was very tough, that last call. But Joe and I went in the boat, jumped onto the boat, and went to Scotland to preach the gospel in the vessel, the time of the town, and the gospel, and then on Fleece as well. And so we came home from that, and we're in, and all along living at the moment up to date. And I went to Kenya for a while, preaching, and then I went to America there for nine weeks as well. So that brings us to the beginning there of this year. And uh, so you can see my life has been telling this message to change my life. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And preaching this message, that's what our province needs. So when I came home, I, I said, what? I sat down and I thought about everything that I was and where I'd been. And I realized I went out back to my first calling, evangelist, to preach the gospel of Christ. I approached the mission board. Of our church they accepted me as an evangelist not only the beginning that was away in about maybe april i'm not employed by them at all i had to get a job i was working for about four months out on the roads and so i put the front pads or curves open the curves and foot pads and uh, and all that sort of chat and the uh, preaching of course at the same time and then i got enough meetings and patients i really sat and at the moment and doing meetings and preaching as the lord comes up the way what the problem is, I had to build up my own support. That's what the mission board to apply me. I have to raise 70% of my wages. And it was done through the support of God's people. I always say, I don't think the Church of Ireland is going to support me. I don't think the people out of Presbyterian is going to support me. Not to give them my good friends in those places as well, the free Presbyterian. So I need people to pray for us, as little car, little strip. Take whatever box. If anyone can financially support us, now you say, oh, take it off the money, keep that fella in shampoo and so <laughs> on. <laughs> or polish. Isn't that right? Listen, a pound a week. It's not much, is it? One pound a week. Five pound a month, perhaps even. Something like that, but more or less. That's all it needs. I need people to support me to pay my wages on the mission board. So we hope this will all be put in place. We're, really, we're trying to get it pushed through for January. To take up the work that but doing missions or doing holiday Bible clubs straight up to now, preaching and all the rest of it. So I need support, how to get the support in place, and I meet the mission board. And uh, what this this is October next month, I meet them in maybe a week or so's time. So I hope they're going to take me on. But if you can help us in any way, certainly by prayer, do remember to pray for us. And if I finance anyone can say yes, a small bit a week and bring out this match. I'm willing to bring the gospel out. Remember, Christ says, Go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. Well, some people can't do it, not everybody can do it, but I'm willing to go and I'm willing to bring this message out to people, the good news of the gospel. But I need support and I need help. If anyone can help us, then certainly help us. And certainly pray for us, and Lord will use us to see people come to Christ. As I said earlier on in my sermon, I found the answer. Christ is the answer. And I am glad that he will bring that answer to Roman Catholic homes, other homes and our problems. He is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's the message I think to bring to people. So pray for us as we do this work. 
the pair of souls may be saved and come to Christ. So we pray that God bless those words. I have a crown things all together, and I hope you can understand and you can follow what I had to say tonight. And the Lord bless you. So I'm just going to close with a wee word of prayer. <coughs> the cards are on the table. I do pick one up as you go home. Father in heaven. We thank you for the opportunity of coming to share our testimony and our calling, the Lord, of how you call us to serve for the gospel of Christ. Write these words upon the hearts of anyone in this meeting. If there's any unsaved, I pray that you'll see them. Maybe there's young men here tonight and you've been dealing with their heart. I pray you'll show them that they will serve you and receive that call of God into thy service. As every member, every person in this congregation, and what's over to pray you receive our thanks for the good things that have been provided. And bless the Lord to our bodies, I pray of thee, and then I pray you'll take us to our homes and safety. In Jesus' name. Amen.